The Peter Schiff Show. Well, today we got the government's non-farm payroll report, otherwise known as the jobs report, for the month of April. And pretty much all of the mainstream Wall Street guys were looking for another strong report. In fact, earlier in the week, Goldman Sachs was out saying that the 200,000 consensus estimate was too low. I forget exactly what they were forecasting, but it was something around 230, 240,000 jobs. And the optimism seemed unfazed by the much weaker than expected ADP report that I spoke about on my last podcast on Wednesday, which came in much lighter than expected. So people didn't care. They said, oh, well, that's a one-off event. We're, we're still looking for a good number. And we got a weak report, one of the weakest reports uh, in a year or maybe two. Instead of 200,000 jobs, we only got 160,000 jobs. And they actually revised down the last couple of months a bit. So I think they took about 13,000, 14,000 jobs away from the last two months. They took the March number uh, down from 215 to 208. But let's get into some of the details because, of course, it gets worse the uh, further beneath the surface you look. Uh, the unemployment rate held steady at 5%. They were expecting it to notch back down to 49 That did not happen. Private payrolls also much lighter than expected. They were looking for 195. They got 171, and they revised down last month from 195 to 184. They did get the 0.3% increase in average hourly earnings. That's what they were looking for. Everybody was excited about that, but they forgot to point out that they took last month's 0.3% increase and revised that down. That was revised down to 0.2, so you can actually chalk that one up as a miss, despite the fact that nobody really was talking about it. But the bigger miss was in the labor force participation rate. They didn't really have a consensus for that. But last month, it was 63, which was a move up, which was one of the first move up we had in a while. But in April, that came back down to 62.8. Uh, and basically, 562,000 people left the labor force during the month of April. That is a massive exodus led by the young people, not the old people. As a matter of fact, there is a breakdown in the household survey of the net job gains and losses. Because remember, when the government says we created 160,000 jobs, that's the net number, right? There's a lot of jobs that got destroyed and a lot of jobs that got created 160,000 nets them out, right? So if you look underneath that, there's a lot of jobs being lost. There's a lot of jobs being gained. One of the big problems is the jobs being lost are high-paying full-time jobs, and the jobs being gained are low-paying part-time jobs. That's the big problem. But listen to this. This is the demographics. For people ages 20 to 24, there were 155,000 job losses in April. So people in that age group, 20 to 24, 155,000 job losses. For people aged 25 to 54, 284,000 losses. Losses. It was for people over the age of 55. That's where you gained 166,000 jobs. In fact, the people over the age 55 now in the workforce is the highest it's ever been. Ever. But between the ages of 25 and 54, we had 284,000 people lose their jobs in one month. You know, Janet Yellen still wants to pretend that the reason that the labor force participation rate is going down is because the baby boom is retiring. I mean, how much longer is she going to get away with that lie? The baby boom is too broke. They can't retire. In fact, many people who had already retired have come out of retirement, you know, to greet people at Walmart or to ring up the cash register or to, you know, serve uh, French fries. They're all working. The people who are leaving the labor force are young people in their 20s and 30s. They're living with their parents in their basements and they're showing up at Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders rallies because they don't have jobs. This is the reality that nobody wants to admit. I've got the breakdown of the job games by sector. And again, the biggest sector, 
professional business and temporary services was the biggest gain, 56,000 uh, gains. Healthcare and education uh, was very high. And leisure and hospitality, number three. Of course, all those jobs are pretty much low-paying jobs. And temporary services was up there. Financial activities uh, there. But manufacturing barely gained any jobs after a huge loss the prior month. We got 4,000 jobs. Wholesale trade barely gained any construction after a big jump last month, only 1,000 jobs. Retail trade lost 3,000 jobs. Mining and logging continues to lose jobs. On the good note, government actually lost jobs. You know, that's a good thing. You know, we don't need all these people working for government. They're not productive. In fact, Rick Santelli made a very good point today on CNBC talking about all the jobs that we've created over at the TSA. I mean, we're not better off because we have those jobs. The fact that we have so many people now at airports, we would be better off if we had a safer country. We'd be better off if we had fewer enemies. And so we didn't have to waste all these resources hiring TSA workers. The fact that we do... We're, we're poor. I don't even think it makes us safer. I don't even think it makes people more confident when they get on a plane that there's not going to be a bomb on it. If anything, it probably causes people not to want to travel because of all the hassles. And so all this is doing is decreasing our standard of living, decreasing our productivity. By the way, I mentioned this on the last podcast that we've now have two quarters of back-to-back losses in productivity. And that's because so many workers are employed non-productively. And that trend is going to continue. But despite this really bad jobs report, the market shrugged it off. I mean, first of all, the stock market was down a little bit, but then it rallied because, of course, bad news is good news because the odds of a Fed rate hike this year are now the lowest they've ever been. I mean, they're practically zero. And, of course, it should be zero if people actually understood. I talked about that uh, on my last podcast. You've got all these central bankers that have been coming out this week talking about how a June rate hike is on the table. Well, obviously, it's not on the table. But if you look at the foreign exchange markets, the dollar was broadly higher today. It wasn't up by a lot, although it was up big again against the Australian dollar, another more than 1% rise because the idiots over there at the Reserve Bank of Australia, they came out and they lowered their inflation target for this year, or not their target, their forecast. They used to be saying inflation would be 2 to 3%, and now they're saying it's going to be 1 to 2%. Now, you would think that's good news because the cost of living rising by about 1.5%, that's better than the cost of living rising by about 2.5%. I remember back in the day when news of low inflation sent your currency higher because people liked the fact that their currency wasn't losing its purchasing power. But it sent the Australian dollar tumbling because everybody believes that now the Reserve Bank in Australia is going to have to cut interest rates several times this year in order to fight this, in order to protect Australians from a cost of living that's not rising fast enough. They want to make sure it rises faster. So this kind of nonsense is keeping pressure on other currencies. So even though we are pushing the next U.S. rate hike further and further into the future, because we're still talking about rate cuts every place else, the dollar is still catching a bid on this relative differential. Although the dollar downtrend, which is still in effect, I don't think has been changed. I think we're still headed lower. But the fact that the dollar didn't tank And, of course, the knee-jerk reaction was a drop in the dollar when this number came out. But, you know, if this was a good number, if we had created 250,000 jobs, the dollar index would have soared, right? I bet, and and gold would have sold off. Now, gold did rally on this, and I think the highest I saw it was up about $17, $18 on the day. It didn't hold onto all those gains. So by the end of the day, the price of gold was only up about 10 bucks closing about 1287. So we're still holding below the 1300 level. Gold stocks had a very good day. They're starting to gain back a lot of what they lost in the prior couple of days. We were up just shy of 4% on this GDX index, although at one point in the day we were up better than 5%. So we didn't close on the highs. Oil prices were up and down all day, but we did manage to close positive. At one point we were way up. But we ended up just up 34 cents at 44.66. So that trend is still intact. But the dollar should have been much weaker. But people are still in denial. People still expect the Fed to raise rates, just not as soon as they thought. And a lot of people are just dismissing 
this job data. They're saying, well, maybe it's a one-off event. It's going to snap back in May. Some people are blaming it on the weather. I mean, the weather, I mean, what, there was weather? Yes, you know, there's always some kind of weather, but I don't know what kind of weather you could use to explain the weak jobs numbers. In fact, they're doing the same thing to blame the weak retail sales numbers. You know, we got more bad news today. And yesterday we got these year-over-year same store uh, sales numbers. Horrible. I think every single company that reported sales missed estimates, and some of them missed by a mile. So retail sales are horrible. And also, let me go over some of the other numbers that we got yesterday. We got the Challenger Job Cut Report. These are announced layoffs. And last month in March, we had 48,207. In April, we had 65,141. That's a big spike. And in fact, so far this year, announced layoffs are the fastest pace, the most layoffs in seven years. Seven years. I mean, you wouldn't know that, right? President Obama says, well, if you're talking stuff like that, you're pre- peddling fiction. That ain't fiction. That's fact. The weekly unemployment claims finally notched up. They jumped up by 17,000 on the week to 274,000. We'll see if that is going to end up being a, a change. Also, we got another drop in the uh, Consumer Sentiment Index. Bloomberg Consumer Comfort Index dropped from 434 all the way down to 42. That is one of the lowest uh, numbers we've had in quite some time. We're breaking to new lows there. You have all this evidence that the economy is under pressure, that consumers are distressed. The one outlier, and I might have an explanation for that, was the consumer credit number. That came out today, and it blew away estimates. I mean, they were looking for an increase of $15.8 billion, and we got an increase of $29.7 billion. That's the highest in many, many years. I forget exactly how many, but that's a huge spike. And that does not jive with these disappointing sales that all these retailers are reporting. If retail sales are plunging, why is credit card debt soaring? And my explanation for that is that consumers are so strapped, they have so little cash, that they are buying things that they used to pay for with cash, but now they're putting it on a credit card because they don't have the cash. And so it's not that they're spending more, it's just that more of what they're buying, they're using a credit card to pay for it because they really can't afford it. A very important, I think, slip happened with Donald Trump. He gave a very, very interesting interview, and I commented on it and Some others picked up on it to CNBC. And he talked a lot about our debt. And there were some very interesting comments, very truthful comments that Donald Trump spoke. One comment in particular, he talked about the fact that, look, if interest rates go up, we can't afford to service the debt. He said he's a low interest rate guy. He wants to keep interest rates low. And the main problem with higher interest rates, other than what he believed would be a stronger dollar, where I disagree with him there, but on the the fact where he talked about that high interest rates, he said we can't afford high interest rates. He said we have to be very careful because if we raise interest rates, even a little bit, he said even a one percentage point increase would, would be a disaster because we don't have the money to pay. And he's right. We don't. And then he talked about how he loves debt, how he's the king of debt. And maybe it's fitting that the king of debt be president of the king of debtors, which is the United States. But what he said about what he's able to do with debt, he said he's an expert at lowering debt. Now, how does Donald Trump lower debt? He restructures. He defaults. Right? He tells creditors, hey, you loan me a dollar. I'm only going to give you back 40 cents. Take it or leave it. That's how he lowers debt. That's how he reduces debt. And you know what? He almost let it slip that that's what he wants to do with U.S. Treasuries. He basically started talking about how we can't pay it and we need to do something. We need to restructure. We need to do something to change it. And Becky Quick, who was one of the persons interviewing him, she actually picked up on this. She's the only one in the studio who did. And she kind of interrupted and said, wait a minute. Hey, are you talking about monkeying with our credit rating? Because obviously if we defaulted, we couldn't beat AAA. Everybody thinks U.S. Treasuries are risk-free because we always pay 100 cents on the dollar. 
And Donald Trump was hinting at the fact that he was thinking about paying less than 100 cents on the dollar, which would mean the risk free rate would would suffer a loss. You would lose principal, not just to inflation, but you would actually lose dollars. And then I think Donald Trump kind of perceived the political implications of what he was saying. And he kind of tried to reverse course. And he talked about, no, 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 we just need to refinance the debt. Well, how is a refi going to help? It's already the interest rates are as low as possible. How do we refinance it? We can't. We've already done that. We've played that thing out. And in fact, most of the Treasury debt is short term because we can't refinance it to long term because we need the short term rates because they're lower. And if short term rates goes up, we're in serious trouble. So refinancing won't work. That doesn't make sense. The only thing that does make sense is a restructure. That's what he's done in the past. That's how he succeeded in the past when he's inherited a situation where there was a lot of debt. Maybe it wasn't even his own debt. Maybe he bought a company that had a lot of debt and then, you know, forced the creditors to take haircuts. Well, that's what he wants to do with America's creditors. That's what he wants to do with the Chinese. Maybe that's the leverage he's talking about. He's going to tell the Chinese, look, you think, you, you know, we're just not going to pay you. You own all these treasuries. Well, we're not we're not going to pay. And this is a big revelation because nobody has had the courage to admit it. And he almost did before he backtracked. So maybe this is going to come up as an issue in the campaign. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe Hillary Clinton will try to make it an issue. But it should be an issue with our creditors. It should be a wake up call that, wait a minute, Donald Trump is right. America can't pay. Look, everybody admits that Puerto Rico is broke. The governor of Puerto Rico came on and gave a speech and said, look, it's all about mathematics. That's, you know, it's math. The math is simple. We don't we can't pay. Well, mathematics applies on the mainland, just like it does in Puerto Rico. And Donald Trump knows the math. He can do the math. If interest rates go up, we can't pay. Obviously, if our creditors want their money back, that's off the table. That's impossible, because the truth is we have more debt than Puerto Rico even if you factor in uh, our relative per capita income, uh, you know you, you adjust for all that. We have more debt, and we are less able to pay. Yet nobody is worried about America, and everybody is worried about Puerto Rico. It's only a question of time because a few years ago, nobody was worried about Puerto Rico either, right? Everybody was willing to loan Puerto Rico money, even though they were broke a few years ago. Yes, they're more broke now, but a few years ago, the math applied back then too. The math didn't add up in Puerto Rico a few years ago. It was only because interest rates were still low that the math didn't matter. Well, mathematically, it doesn't work for the United States either. Now, with interest rates at practically zero, we can get by just like Puerto Rico was able to get by. But once our creditors demand more money because they wake up just like the Puerto Rican creditors woke up and demanded more money, then the party is over. And then what's going to happen? Well, Donald Trump is saying, well, we're going to have to restructure. We're going to have to default because there is no other way out. Unless, of course, we're just going to print massive quantities of money, massive quantitative easing. But the reality of it is our creditors will lose more if they get paid in full than if they take a haircut. Because the only way we can pay them in full is to print a bunch of money and then the money is going to collapse in value. And so then the money our creditors get won't be worth anything. So I'd rather get back 50 cents on the dollar and be able to buy something with my 50 cents than get back 100 cents on the dollar, but not be able to buy anything. Of course, one of the funny things, too, is I think the New York Times wrote an article and they pointed this out, too. And they basically said, hey, Donald Trump is right in his understanding of monetary policy, that we need to keep interest rates low. But he's wrong in understanding how to deal with debt because obviously we can't default. But we don't need to keep interest rates low. We only need it in a sense that heroin addict needs heroin. Now, does he really need it? Well, if he wants to stay high, he needs it. But is that the right thing or is the right thing to stop taking heroin and go to rehab? So we only need to keep interest rates at zero to the extent that we're not going to solve our problems. If we want to maintain air in this bubble, then yes, we got to keep interest rates at zero. But as long as we do that, we're going to keep destroying real good jobs. Our standard of living is going to keep going up. Now, that's going to serve Donald Trump very well between now and the election, because the worse the economy is, the more support he's going to have. But if he becomes president and he actually wants to do something good for the country, then we need to go into rehab. We can't keep taking these drugs. We need higher interest rates. Yes, 
We can't pay the debt when interest rates go up, but that means we have to default. We have to restructure because the alternative is keeping interest rates artificially low so that we can pretend we're solvent, but then all the problems that Donald Trump is hoping to solve are going to be made worse. You know, another problem that I was, I listened to this discussion during the week on CNBC. I don't know, maybe it was motivated by the fact that Switzerland is actually going to be voting on this. I think this is going to happen in June. They're going to vote for a basic income, which means that every single citizen in Switzerland, regardless of uh, their, their health or their wealth, is going to be guaranteed $2,600 or the equivalent, obviously, in Swiss francs, but $2,600 a month tax free. Uh, and each child, and I guess the child, uh, you know, the money goes to the parent, but each child is going to get $650 tax free. So I guess if you, if you add all that up, let's say you have a married couple with two kids, they're going to get $6,500 a month tax free. And you multiply that by 12, that's $78,000 a year, tax-free. Now, how much would an American family have to earn to have $78,000 after tax? I don't know, probably at least 100000 So could you believe that the Swiss are actually going to vote to say, hey, every family of four is going to get the equivalent of $100,000 a year, whether they work or not? I mean, this, I mean, to me, this seems like a ridiculous amount of money to be to be paying in this basic income. And I think the Swiss are going to vote it down. I mean, they voted down that ridiculous minimum wage law that someone put on the ballot. So I think they might vote this down as well. But they had a discussion about this idea of a basic income. And I suppose the whole idea of this basic income is that it's going to replace any other kind of means tested uh, welfare system. So uh, no more welfare or housing benefits or food stamps or things like that. You just get uh, the the basic income. Now, there is a economic argument to be made, but the one that they were making on CNBC is not it. This is how ridiculous these guys are. They were talking about why this is a good thing. And the only thing that they said was that, well, it's good because it helps maintain uh, spending. And businesses like the idea of a basic income because it means they're going to have customers. Because if everybody has a basic income, well, then everybody can go out and spend. And all that guaranteed spending is going to help the economy. I mean, what a complete bunch of nonsense. Just printing up money and giving it to people to spend doesn't grow the economy. What grows the economy is savings and capital investment and production. And none of that is going to be uh, brought into existence by the basic income. Here is the economic argument in favor of the basic income. Now, first of all, the best thing is nothing. No welfare state, no basic income. You want an income, you go out and get a job. That's it. And if for some reason you can't work, well, then you ask your family members to support you. Maybe they will. You can hit up your friends. And worst case, try a charity. That's it. The government shouldn't be doing it. But if we're going to make the mistake of having some kind of self, you know, social welfare system, here is one of the benefits of the basic income guarantee. One of the biggest problems of welfare is fraud, right? All sorts of people commit fraud in order to qualify for various welfare programs. But that also means you have to have all these bureaucrats to vet everybody. You have to have all kinds of investigations to try to make sure that the people who are getting the benefits actually qualify. And that costs a lot of money uh, to do all that screening. And of course, there's a moral hazard, which is the second part of the problem with welfare, is that when the government says, okay, in order to get welfare, these are the criteria, right? You can't have a job or you can't have a high income or as you get income, the benefits are phased out or you can't get the, 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 the benefit if you're, if you're married, right? You can't get the aid the money that women get for their children. You don't get the money if you're married, but if you're single, you don't know where the father is, well, then you can have the money. So what happens is people rearrange their circumstances to qualify for the benefits. Everybody wants free money, and the government sets out the criteria, and so people either lie to meet the criteria or they actually alter their behavior to meet the criteria, which means not working when they probably could get a job. Right? Because if you're going to lose your welfare benefits as you get a job, well, why get a job? 
just take the welfare benefits. There are a lot of people that would prefer a welfare check to a, to a paycheck because the welfare check just comes in the mail and it comes with all sorts of other perks like housing subsidies and health care subsidies. But to get a paycheck, you actually got to work. You got to wake up early in the morning. You got to show up. You got to commute. You got to be on time. You got to deal with a boss you might not like. You have to deal with stress. There's all sorts of things that has to happen. I mean, it's much better to sleep late, go to the park, go to the beach, have fun and get a check, right? So these are the moral hazards of the welfare state. The basic income, not to a 100% degree, but to a large degree, mitigates some of these moral hazards. Because first of all, you don't have to worry about fraud. Everybody gets it. You don't have, so you don't have to have an army of bureaucrats trying to make sure that the people who are applying are entitled. Everybody gets it, right? Now, of course, obviously, if you're making $200,000 a year and then you're paying taxes and then you're getting back some of those tax money in your basic income, right? You're not actually getting anything, right? You're getting your basic income check, but it's like a tax refund because your net still paying in. So obviously the wealthy people aren't really getting it because what they're getting back is a tax cut. The people that actually get something from the basic income are the people whose basic income check exceeds their tax liability. So if you're getting, you know, 25,000 whatever it is in basic income, but you're only paying 5,000 in taxes, then you net got $20,000 from the basic income. Uh, but you know, if you're if you paid a million dollars in taxes and you got 25,000 back, I mean you barely notice it. But the fact that you just get it regardless, there's not going to be as much fraud. Now there'll still be some because remember, there are, there are dead people collecting Social Security. There are people who don't even exist. So you're still going to have fictitious people uh, that some people might dummy up a phony identity in order to collect basic income checks for several people. So there's still going to be some fraud. And so you're still going to have to investigate it. But it's not going to be as much fraud as you would have with these means-tested systems. But the moral hazard is also reduced somewhat because you no longer have the, the, the penalty, the tax penalty of getting a job and losing your benefits, because that means the marginal rate of tax is very high. Because if you go from welfare to work, not only do you pay taxes on the money you earn, but you lose your benefits that you were getting for free. So that loss of a benefit is like an extra tax. And so it acts as a barrier uh, to getting a job because it a it discourages people from getting a job, but in some cases the math works out so that you're actually better off not having the job. So obviously, if you have the basic income, you'll cut down on that. But the problem is, a, like in a country like Switzerland, they're making the basic income so high, especially when you got a married couple and kids, that I mean, there's a pretty powerful incentive not to work at all because leisure is very valuable. People desire leisure. I mean, why do you think so many people work with a dream or a goal of retiring? Because retiring means you don't have to work. And that's such a valuable thing that people work their whole lives hoping to save enough money so they can eventually stop working. The way this Swiss basic income is going to work, you can skip all that hard work and go right from, you know, from school to retirement and skip everything in between because the basic income is so high. Now, obviously, the per capita income in Switzerland is higher, so the cost of living in Switzerland is higher than it is in, in the United States. So, obviously, these numbers would be lower here. But I still think it sounds like it's too lucrative, even for the Swiss. But, you know, I still have some reservations myself whether or not I think that a basic income welfare program would be less harmful than what we have today. Because what we have today is a complete disaster. And so maybe a system like this would be an improvement to what we have. But again, the ideal system is a free market where the government doesn't create any kind of moral hazard and where all able-bodied people work. Nobody can just choose a life of leisure unless they've earned enough money to afford it. So if you don't want to work and you want to spend all your time writing poetry that you can't sell and painting pictures that nobody wants to buy and just philosophizing with your friends or smoking pot or you know hanging out at the beach. If you want to do all that, don't expect the taxpayer to subsidize it. 
Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with TruthinMedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, TruthinMedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into the Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.